The slides are already in your slide folder, so you, okay, you, you don't have to take notes so, so heavily. Okay, so today we are going to, to talk um, about something different, which has to do with dimensionality reduction. But I'm still going to be using, uh, at times, this data from this task that we talked about last time, which is this very simple uh, reach task where there is the reaches are from a center to one out of eight targets. And the task is uh, not memory guided, but, but uh, sensory guided. And um, it's, um, you know, after the target is presented, the subject has to wait for a go queue and then execute the reach. And the whole thing takes just a few seconds for each reach. So in each session, be it a human or a monkey, many reaches can be done. And then one obtains data like this, as I showed you last time. We, I'm again color coding the eight targets, and this is 20 seconds of data, and it's taken this multi electrode arrays that allow us to record of the order of 100 neurons at a time. And, uh, and here, what I've done is I've uh, I played a game uh, for you, which is the following. Every time that there is a reach, this is when the target comes up and the target in this case had three reaches during these 20 seconds of data, one to the yellow target at the bottom, one to the red target all the way to the left, and one to the blue target all the way to the right. So for each one of these targets, I'm going to focus on a window of 300 milliseconds, which is centered around the go signal. So I'm going to focus not dynamically over how the spikes are changing over time, but just every target, every trial will be characterized by a single data point, which is given by these, how many spikes every one, each one of these neurons has emitted, has put out during this 300 millisecond window centered around the go signal. So it's uh, typically 150 milliseconds before the go signal and 150 milliseconds afterwards. So th there is just no dynamics. There is one data point per trial. So for each one of these data points, I could put it in an, in an 80 dimensional neural space, a state space where every axis corresponds to the activity of, of one of the neurons that we are recording from. But um, I cannot show you this 80 dimensional space. I'll, I'll show you uh, just a three dimensional space. I, I just pick three neurons at random here, the ones in red, this one, this one, and this one. So that now I can put a data point um, in this three dimensional space for each one of the trials. And after I put all the data points corresponding to many trials, I've color coded them. And the question that I'm asking is, is an, is a, uh, an inference question. So given this activity, can you tell me what was the target? Can you tell me to which target the monkey is going to move? Can you infer that from the data? And this is the problem. The problem is, okay, this is the three-dimensional space. I'm looking at neuron 46, neuron 70, neuron 78. Every point corresponds to a different trial. The trials are organized, color-coded in the usual way. And what I'm saying is that if I'm measuring eight neurons, every trial is represented by an n-dimensional vector of firing rates. So I go from firing rate one to firing rate n, where every firing rate is simply the number of neurons, the number of spikes emitted during this 300 millisecond interval divided by 300 millisecond, divided by the width of the interval in order to make it a rate. So this is how this plot was generated. And why is this a problem? This is a problem because what I'm asking you to do is to infer which one of the eight classes a given trial belongs to from the location of that trial in this particular state space. And as you can see, that's going to be a very difficult thing to do because there is no clustering in this space. If I look, for instance, at, at the trial here, which is a trial to the purple target, it's very close to trials to the yellow target and the blue target and the green target and the red targets. So how is this location in the state space going to give me information about to which target the trial was, was meant to be directed, that reach was meant to be directed? So, and how are we going then to decode? How are we going to extract that information from this kind of data? So keep that in mind, because we are going to go back to this question. 
So what we are going to do is a more astute dimensionality reduction than just picking three axes at random and use that as a three-dimensional representation of this hundred-dimensional state space. So most of you know about this, but let me quickly remind you about principal component analysis. So we have the data and every data point is an n-dimensional vector because I'm measuring in this case n neurons simultaneously. And every reach gives me a data point. So I have m reaches, m data points. So every data point is, a, is an n-dimensional vector. And I organize these vectors as columns in a matrix. So this is the first reach and neurons one to n, the second reach, neurons one to m, and the last reach, neurons one to m. So I end by a, with an n by m matrix that has this, the same structure as the raster. Every row corresponds to a neuron, neuron one, neuron two, up to neuron n. That's my empirical neural space, that space space of the activity of the neurons that are being recorded. And then every column represents one instance, one trial, one of the reaches. So we are given data like this. This is a typical representation of this kind of neural data. And we're going to estimate the firing rate of each neuron. And we do that by taking the empirical, it's an empirical estimate, it's not the true mean, it's an estimate based on the data. So for each neuron, I sum all the activity on a row, which is all the trials for that neuron, and I divide by M, which is the number of trials. So I, X, I, K is the activity of neuron I on which K. I sum K from one to M and I divide by M. And that's, I put a hat over it because it's an estimate. It's an empirical estimate based on data. So I subtract that mean from the corresponding row. So I end up with a matrix, which is exactly like this one, but this matrix now in centered. I have subtracted the mean. And uh, from now on, the rest of the talk, I, I'm going to assume that you always do that. That's the first thing that you do to your data. It's not a complete whitening. I'm not dividing by the variance, but I'm centering the data. I'm subtracting the mean. So once I have done that, I can use this new matrix X, which has its mean center, to do X, X transpose. And that will give me an estimate of the covariance of the data. Again, an empirical estimate based on the data. So that's a covariance matrix C hat. If you really wanted to be an estimate of the covariance, you have to keep this denominator, M um, divided by M minus one. But so what you do is, your, what this matrix operation means is that the ij element is the ith row of x times the j column of x, because that's x transpose. So the j column of x transpose, which is the j column of x. So you get the ith row with the mean subtracted, the j row with the mean subtracted, and you correlate or look at the covariance between neuron i and neuron j, by summing over all the possible trials and divided by n. And so you get an n by n, where n is the number of neurons, estimate of the covariance matrix. So once you have this estimate of the covariance matrix, which again, I, I call C hat to remind myself and to remind our, ourselves that this is based on an estimate of the data, we do a diagonalization of that matrix. It's a symmetric matrix. We can compute the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues all the eigenvalues are going to be real and positive, and all the eigenvectors are going to have norm one and to be orthogonal to each other. So this is the definition of an eigenvector that the matrix C acting on that eigenvector is this, leaves the eigenvector alone, except that it multiplies it by a scalar lambda, which is the eigenvalue. So it doesn't rotate the eigenvector, it just leaves it in the direction in which it was, it just simply rescales it. The eigenvector has norm one, but now it's multiplied by the eigenvalue lambda. So that's the effect. These are very specific directions in which the effect of applying the matrix to that vector is simply to multiply that vector by a scalar, to rescale it. So this is what we call principal component analysis, is finding these eigenvectors, which are the principal components and the corresponding eigenvalues. And we'll see in a moment how we use that. But Principal component analysis is related to something very interesting, which you know those of you who have a background in physics probably have not learned as physicists, because as physicists we always 
always look at square matrices, you know, covariance matrices and Hamiltonians and things like that. But let's go back to the X matrix itself, which was not a square matrix, it was a rectangular matrix, it had N rows, one per neuron, but M columns, one per trial. We can do a decomposition of this data matrix, which is called a singular value decomposition, in which this data matrix is written as a product of three matrices. There is a matrix U. The matrix U is N by N. It has N columns, and this N, each one of these columns is a normal vector perpendicular to all the other columns. So it's an orthonormal matrix, and it gives me a basis in an N-dimensional space, which is the space of the neurons. The V matrix, in contrast, is M by M. It's a matrix where each column represents a basis for in the space of samples, not in the space of neurons. And here, what appears is not V, but V transpose. But in V, each one of the columns is normalized and orthogonal to every other column. And it provides a basis for the space of samples. And because typically we are in a case where M is larger than N, so we have more samples or more data points than, than neurons. So this matrix sigma, which is a diagonal matrix, it actually is a rectangular matrix. So it has an N by N diagonal block, and then the rest of the columns that I need to come to get to M columns are simply zeros. So because this matrix has so many zeros, the last rows of V are not seen, or the last, the last rows of V transpose, or the last columns of V are not seen. So Although V has M columns and V transpose has M rows, I only see the first M of them because the rest are multiplied by the zeros coming from sigma. And that emphasizes the fact that X can have at most rank N. So I have an N-dimensional basis in the N-dimensional space of neurons, but I also have an N-dimensional basis in the M-dimensional space of samples. The rest of the space of samples corresponds to dimensions that are not being seen by this matrix. So there is a very simple relationship between doing a singular value decomposition and doing a principal component analysis. So we thought so we could write X as U sigma V transpose. So what, what is X X transpose? Well, X is U sigma V transpose. And then X transpose is the transpose of this, which will give me the transpose of V transpose, which is V, the transpose of sigma, which is sigma transpose, and transpose of U. Now, v, trans v is an orthonormal matrix. So V transpose V is the identity. So what this gives me is a U all the way to the left, a U transpose all the left to the, to the, to the right, and then this product of sigma, sigma transpose. The product of sigma sigma transpose, I'm going to call lambda, actually after I normalize by n minus one, because I cannot construct the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix was x x transpose divided by n minus one. And now this covariance matrix can be written as u lambda u transpose, where lambda is essentially sigma squared. So this now becomes a principal component analysis. So the singular value decomposition gives me a basis in neural space, which are the principal components are these, these n vectors, each one of them are normalized, norm one, and each one of them orthogonal to all the other ones. So I get a basis in the n-dimensional space of neurons. So I get u and u transpose, and I get the lambdas, which are the eigenvalues of the principal components, which are the squares of the singular values. This is another way of, of seeing yourself that the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, because the covariance matrix is symmetric, the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix are always going to be positive or zero, but always not negative. So how do we use this principal component analysis to do dimensionality reduction? So I told you that we have this diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. Now this diagonal matrix is, is n by n and has this form, lambda 1, lambda n. Usually the principal component analysis algorithms order the eigenvalues 
So the lambda one is the largest one and lambda n is the smallest one. So that now we can um, also order the eigenvectors. Each eigenvector corresponds to an eigenvalue. And I can think of leading eigenvectors, which are the ones associated with the largest eigenvalues, and non-leading eigenvectors, which are the ones associated with the smallest eigenvalues. So we can use this idea to do dimensionality reduction. So in principle, remember that the covariance matrix can be written as u lambda u transpose, which means that now I have what is called a spectral decomposition of the covariance matrix, because lambda is diagonal and u u transpose is going to give me these external products. So I can write C as a sum of over the n components, over the n eigenvalues, eigenvectors, each sum is a matrix given not by the external product. So remember that u is a column vector, u transpose is a row vector. So the product of this column vector by this row vector is going to give me a matrix, a matrix of rank one, but it's, it's an n by n matrix of rank one. And this matrix is weighted by the corresponding eigenvalue lambda. So that's another way of thinking of the covariance matrix is as a linear superposition of contributions, each one of them coming from one of the principal components. But because the eigenvalues are now ordered, I can decide not to keep all of them. If I keep all of them, this is an identity. This is not an approximation. I haven't done any dimensionality reduction. I'm still staying in the n-dimensional space. I'm keeping my n-dimensional basis given by the n eigenvectors, and I'm just decomposing the matrix in this what is called a spectral decomposition in this sum of contributions each one of them associated with one of the eigenvectors and the weighted by the corresponding eigenvalue but i could decide to truncate this sum and to keep only the leading eigenvalues and when i truncate this sum and i set the sum all the way up to n i only keep the k leading eigenvalues and the k leading outer products of eigenvectors then we are in a situation where we're doing dimensionality reduction. And this is the way it works in principal component analysis. So we go from an exact decomposition of the covariance matrix into an approximation to the covariance matrix. So imagine I have this data. This data is living in a three-dimensional space. And I find the principal components. So the principal component one is going to be associated with this direction, which is the direction of the largest eigenvalue. Is the direction, remember that all the data is centered in the zero, zero, zero point, but along each one of these axes, the data has a variance, has a spread. So the largest eigenvalue corresponds to the direction of maximum variance. Then the next one, which is perpendicular to it is PC2. This gives me sort of a planar ellipse of data. And then the next one, which is related to even smaller fluctuations, is PC3, which is a component out of the plane. So if, obviously, if I keep all the components, if I don't do any dimensionality reduction, it's the same data as before. I haven't done anything. Instead of looking at it in axes, along axes that corresponds to the x, y, let's say x, y, and c, the axis along this cube, I'm going to use axis given by PC1, PC2, and PC3. I've just done a change of basis. But now I can say, well, look, PC3, there is very small excursion of the data along PC3. Along PC3, the data stays pretty close to its mean. It has a very small variance. So what about I neglect those fluctuations? And I just keep the fluctuations along the direction to leading principal components. Then I can project the data in a space where the bases are given by PC1 and PC2. These are the two basis vectors. Remember, unit vectors perpendicular to each other, they give bases. And I, if I take only those components, then I'm essentially projecting all the data onto the plane spanned by PC1 and PC2 because I'm neglecting the PC3 component, which will be out of that, out of the the slides towards, towards me, I'm neglecting the fact that the data could have a component there, and I'm making a two-dimensional approximation to three-dimensional data. Well, of course, this can be applied for not for only to go from three to two, but to go from any dimensionality n 
to any dimensionality k, where k is more than n, and can be used then to do dimensionality reduction. So this is the essence of principal component analysis. We construct from the data our estimate of the covariance matrix C. We diagonal, we find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix C. So the matrix C applied to an eigenvector U gives me lambda times U. And then we construct the matrix U in which these eigenvectors appear as columns. So the matrix U is an orthonormal matrix in which each column is one of these eigenvectors. U transpose is a transpose of U. And then C can be decomposed in this way as U lambda U transpose, where the lambda is the diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. And then I can go to this space. So I started with data that is, was in the space X. And remember, I went to a new coordinate system that was centered on the, on the, on the mean. So now I, I have subtracted the mean. And at that point, instead of putting two axes parallel to X1 and X2, I put axes parallel to the two eigenvectors. I should have called them U1 and U2. I'll correct that. U1 and U2, and that gives me this axis Y1 and Y2, which are the new coordinates in which I'm going to describe the data. And the spread of the data along these directions is related to the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalues are variances. So the standard deviation, which is the size of the spread, is the square root of the eigenvalues. So the square root of lambda one gives me an idea of the standard deviation of the data, a measure of the standard deviation of the data along this axis. And the square root of lambda two gives me a measure of the standard deviation of the data along this axis. And if you are given the matrix X, here I call it X tilde to remind myself that I have centered the data. If I project it onto the, uh, onto the eigenvectors U, so I use U transpose, I use it the, the, as rows, then I get the coordinates of the data in the new system I, Y. And then of course I could use, as we said before, the same dimensionality. So in this case, it's just a, a looking at the data from a different coordinate system, which is centered at the mean and aligned with the ellipsoidal structure of the data. But I could also use it to keep not all the eigenvectors, but a subset, the leading eigenvectors, and use this method then for dimensionality reduction. So before I, I go into the idea of latent variables, I, I think you most of you know about principal components, but I let me stop here and ask if you have any questions so far. Any questions? No, I think it's good. Thank you. So far, so good. Okay. So now I want you to think of the problem in a, from the other point of view. So here, I told you how to go from the x's to the y's, but I'm going to actually tell you how to go from the y's to the x's, which is the idea of using a generative model. So in the same way that y could be obtained by applying u transpose on x, x can be obtained by applying u on y. So X tilde, which is my, uh, my data, can be applied, can be obtained from applying U to Y. So if I know the Y, so let's say these are the Ys, and I've done some dimensionality reduction, so the vector Y has fewer components than the vector X. So I have to hear a component YJ, a component XI, and then the XI can be obtained by a linear combination u i j y j where u i j is the i-th component of the j eigenvector so u i j is a weight that goes from the heat from the latent variable i want to call this a latent variable y to the actual observable variable x so usually when we do principal components is i give you the observables and you obtain the principal component and now I want you to think of the opposite way that is, if I gave you the principal components, could you then reconstruct the data? Could you obtain data from that? And so this is the idea of using principal components as a latent variable, which means it's a generative model. So let's say that in the Y space, I think that the data is Gaussian. 
So I'm going to assume that in the white space, the data has a normal distribution centered, of course, at zero, because remember that I subtracted the mean. So the, the y coordinates are centered at the mean. They have zero means. So it's a normal distribution with zero mean. And the variances are the corresponding lambda. So the variances along y1 is lambda 1. The variances along y2 is lambda 2. The standard deviations are the square root of the eigenvalues. The variances are the eigenvalues. So if I assume a normal distribution in the y-axis, I can reconstruct the distribution in the x space. So this is x1 and x2, because each component of x can be written as a linear combination of the components of y. So if I generate points in the y space, in the hidden space, according to this normal distribution with zero mean and the diagonal covariance matrix where the variances are the eigenvalues, if I sample that distribution and I have this linear transformation, I can reconstruct the distribution in the original space. So in the same way in which I can do this idea of a generative modern and latent variables for principal components, I can now extend this idea into a new class of models, which is called probabilistic principal component. So the idea is to introduce noise in the generative model. So I start again with my latent variables, the dimensionality reduced representation. I'm going to assume that the probability distribution for each one of the y's is a normal distribution with zero mean and a variance given by the corresponding eigenvalue. But now the way I generate the i component of x is not simply by a linear combination, ui, uh, sorry, uij, yj, some from j equals one to d, but I'm going to add a noise term, eta i, to that particular component of x. So now this is now a noisy generative process. But I'm going to assume that each one of these noise terms has the same variance. So each noise term, eta i, although there is an eta 1, eta 2, eta 3 associated with each component, they are all drawn from the same distribution. The, each, the noise, of course, has zero mean and has a variance sigma squared, which is the same variance for all the components of x. So if I make that assumption, I get a Gaussian distribution for the probability of xi given yj, so it's a conditional distribution, is a normal centered on that uij yj, but has now a variance sigma squared. And if I now think that xi is actually being generated not by yj, but by all the y's, as is the case, then I have to think of the probability distribution of xi given the whole vector y. And that probability distribution is going to be a normal center now at the sum, center at this term, the linear combination of all the yj's, the linear combination of all the latent variables, the coefficients of the linear combination are the corresponding uh, vectors, the corresponding eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, remember this, J is the jth column, so that's the jth eigenvector, and i is the i component of that eigenvector. So I make this linear combination, but now I have a noise term with variance sigma squared. And then in the next step of sophistication in creating these probabilistic generative models is to think of this noise as having an amplitude or a variance that is specific to each one of the nodes, is specific to each one of the components of X that I am reconstructing. And that's what it's called factors analysis, which has exactly the same structure. We start by thinking that the probability distribution of each one of the latent variables is a Gaussian with zero mean. So it's a normal distribution with zero mean and a variance equal to the corresponding eigenvalue lambda J. Our generative model is again a noisy linear combination or the i component of x is given by the sum uij yj, j sum from one to d plus eta i. Eta i is the noise term associated with the i component of the vector that I'm trying to reconstruct, the vector of observables. 
these are this, the excess living the real world the y's live in our imagination they are latent variables and the probability distribution of the noise now is again zero mean noise but the sigma square depends on i so some of these components of the x vector are going to be more noisy than others the noise is going to depend on the i component so again now i can write the probability distribution of xi given yj is the gaussian center at uij yj with variance sigma i squared and if i actually allow for the fact that xi depends not only on yj but depends on all the components of the latent vector depends on all the latent variables then i write that the probability distribution of xi given the vector y is again a normal distribution centered at the linear combination uij yj sand over j times sigma i square so these are the three typical methods used for linear dimensionality reduction principal component analysis probabilistic principal component analysis and factors analysis and the only difference is that we if that principal component analysis is a purely deterministic algorithm in probabilistic principal component analysis we allowed for for noise in the reconstruction but this noise is isotropic it has the same amplitude in all components and then in factors analysis we allow for the fact that the noise is actually anisotropic in the model, so it's component dependent. So now let me go back to the problem that I posed at the beginning, the problem of decoding these neural data obtained on the reaches. And I had shown you that this very naive idea of doing three-dimensional representation by picking three neurons at random and showing you a three-dimensional state space based on that random choice of three of the original axes, the neural axis, is not a good representation. However, if I do factors analysis and I restrict the representation to the three leading eigenvectors and the three leading eigenvalues, so now these are what I would call in neural modes, and we go back to why I call them neural modes, we'll go back to that later. But if I think of neural mode one, neural mode two, neural mode three, now I see something very, very different in this space now what is a neural mode a neural mode is an eigenvector an eigenvector is a direction in the n-dimensional space an eigenvector has components one two three n has components along each of the axes so an eigenvector does not correspond to neuron one neuron two or neuron three an eigenvector is a direction in that neural space that corresponds to a particular pattern of activation of all these neurons is not a neuron but a direction that involves all the neurons in that space so it's a, that's why i call it a neural mode so it's an abstract axis it's not a physical measurement like the activity of a given neuron but in this very abstract three-dimensional representation first of all i see clustering so that the location of a point in this space is indicative of the target to which that particular reach is uh, directed but moreover i want you to focus on the following these clusters not order are fairly well separated but they are ordered and they capture the representation of the targets in real space so this was very surprising to us the first time we saw it but here you see i go from the red target to the orange to the yellow to the green and here i go from the red target to the orange to the yellow to the green so now think how mysterious this is really and what it's telling us about the brain now that you are i know that you're more interested in machine learning than in the brain but to the extent where we talk about our, our deep networks and our recurrent networks as maybe good models for how the brain works think of what i'm doing here the brain is made of neurons so the the actual natural representation for the brain is this is this neural space is a state space where every axis corresponds to a neuron and i think i told you last time that when i make a simple reach of the order of a million neurons in my primary motor cortex are participating are being modulated by by the activities being modulated by this very 
simple task. So this neural space is actually a million dimensions. I'm only measuring a hundred of dimensions. So I'm doing a very, um, a, a, an extreme subsampling empirically and experimentally when I try to capture the, the population activity of these million neurons. But moreover, in this hundred dimensional space, I find three directions, three particular patterns of activations of the neurons, such that when I project the data into these three dimensions, which is something in some sense, totally abstract and imaginary, I find an incredibly faithful representation of the organizations of the targets for that particular task. That is not only clustered, that tells me that the information can be decoded, but it's clustered in a way that captures an important feature of how these targets are organized in real space. So this is this is this really a, um, a very interesting idea about about these internal representations, which are the same internal representations that you see when you do deep learning and you go from hidden layer to hidden layer to hidden layer, and you're representing features of the inputs. You're not representing the input, but you're representing relevant features that will allow you to do the classification task or the, or the uh, prediction task correctly or the regression task correctly. And in the brain, we find a structure, we find low dimensional representations that allow us to perform the task correctly because this is the activity in M1 and M1, the primary motor cortex is only two steps away from your muscles. This activity is read by neurons in your spinal cord that are called motor neurons. And these neurons in the spinal cord connect to your muscles. So, you know, you have these very long axons, for instance, from the bottom of your spinal cord, like where your spinal, where your spinal column ends, all the way down your leg to the foot to allow you to move the muscles so that you can walk properly or to allow you to wiggle your toes. So, you're only two steps away from sending instructions to muscles to contract so that you can reach, you can grasp, you can walk, you can move your muscles in your face so that you can talk. And all the information has to be in this primary motor cortex. Motor neurons don't receive information from anybody else. They receive feedback from the muscles and all the information in the brain comes to the motor neurons from the primary motor cortex. So to understand Representations in the primary motor cortex is a very important component of understanding behavior in the sense of moving, how we move in the world. And in the same way in which we are interested in understanding representations in the hidden layers, in the intermediate layers of a deep network or in the dynamics of a recurrent network and how these representations evolve. And the common feature, and I think that, that the Chaim Sampolis in his is going to tell you about this. The common feature is that these representations are always low dimensional. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a motivation of why the brain would have evolved that way and why we then construct neural networks that have that property that of, of using low dimensional representations. So um, I'm going to switch gears now to more abstract mathematics. So before I do, do you have any questions about this or any comments? Any questions? Go ahead. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me from here? I hear you, yeah. OK. Uh, it's on the previous slide uh, about the Gaussian assumption on the Ys. Uh, is this just a way to do simple computations or? Uh, is justified also empirically? That's a very, a very good question. The only thing I know about the distribution in white space is that I centered the data, so the mean is zero, and I know the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. So I only know first and second moments. So if I only know first and second moments, I should always make a Gaussian assumption. Okay. Because the Gaussian distribution is the maximal entropy distribution constrained to having a specific first moment and a specific second moment. 
I shouldn't make any more sophisticated assumptions unless I have information about higher order moments. I, you are familiar with the concept of a maximal entropy distribution. So it, it reflects that beyond first and second moments, I'm ignorant. So I shouldn't assume I have more information than that. So I should allow for maximal entropy given those two constraints. And that is always a multivariate Gaussian. Okay. And in this case, the covariance matrix is very easy because in the Y space, the covariance matrix is diagonal. What the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors do is diagonalize the covariance matrix. So now the covariance matrix is diagonal and the diagonal elements are the lambdas because they are the variance along direction one, direction principal component one, principal two, lambda one, principal component two with lambda two and so forth. <laughs> So you could make more sophisticated assumptions, but then you have to know more. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Remember that we only compute the mean and the covariance of the data. We didn't compute more than that. Now, if you have very good data and you want to compute more than that, then you can make a more sophisticated model for the probability distribution on the latent, on the hidden layer of your generative model. But if you, for instance, if you're doing things like cal using Kalman filters as a generative model for which the observables are derived, you're also making a Gaussian assumption. So in some sense, Gaussian assumptions and models go together very nicely, you know, so they, they, they because as you can see, I'm making a Gaussian assumption in my latent variable and then all my generative models were linear models. So the way I, I regenerated the data X from my, from my Gaussian latent variables Y is linear for PCA, for probability PCA, and for factors analysis, okay? okay? That's the simplest kind of way of thinking of data. And actually, if you're ever going to work with real data, that's the first thing you should do. Why? Because these are well-defined procedures. They don't depend on additional parameters. If you do it and I do it, we are going to agree on the result because we didn't have to choose, we didn't have any fudge factors. We didn't have to hack anything, make any ad hoc assumptions. So they're well-defined methods. Their properties are very well understood and they will fail at some point, right? Because they are Gaussian and linear and, and they are, we know that the reality is going to be more complex than that. But by looking at how they fail, you're going to develop some intuition of how to go nonlinear. What is the next step that you should take? Because once you open the door to nonlinear models, it's, it's an infinite variety of choices, right? There are many, many ways. There are only a few ways to write down a linear model with or without noise, and the noise isotropic or anisotropic, and that's it. But once you go into a nonlinear uh, family of models, that's, that's an infinite family, essentially. So which nonlinear model are you going to choose? How are you going to make that choice? The failure of your linear model will guide you what was missing and what kind of nonlinear model you should pick up. So in, in my group, we, we, it's, it's, a, it's a way of life. We always start linear, right? And we push it until it fails and that tells us what to do next. Any other questions? No, I don't think so. Okay, so let me go back to this, uh, to, to the neurons for a moment. So we have this very large network of neurons. We are subsampling, we are putting an electrode array that only detects a few neurons. And you observe the spiking activity of those neurons, in this case, neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. So as I observe the spiking activity, I get the spikes emitted by neuron one, neuron two, and neuron three. And now I can put my, I can take a bin and move that bin as time passes. And each time the bin is in one place, I can measure the activity of neuron one, neuron two, neuron three, that gives me a point in state space, which is again, each axis corresponds to a given neuron. So that gives me the point at time one, and then I move the bin at point two, a point at time three, and I get the trajectory in that space. And it's a very interesting observation that one can make in many, many different areas of the brain, that these trajectories, give me one second. 
<laughs> so um, these points generate a trajectory. And what we see empirically, this is an experimental observation. And we don't see it only in primary motor cortex. We see it in a lot of varieties of cortical areas that these trajectories, first of all, they are confined, of course, they don't explore all possible neural states, but they could be confined with, with a small, small object that has the same dimensionality as the full space. But that's not what we see. We see that these trajectories are confined to low dimensional structures, which could be flat, like hyperplanes in this case, in which the case they are linear. And all the methods like principal component analysis or factors analysis can find them. Or we might need to consider the possibility of nonlinear manifolds, which is what we're going to do for the rest of the talk. So Chaim uh, Sompolinsky might uh, talk about using this characterizes using what is called the convex hull of these points. So the convex hull of these points is, is like a little like a little egg like that contains all the points inside. So you have not left anything outside. But the problem of the convex hull is that the convex hull, because of the fluctuations of these points, because the data is noisy, and the fluctuations could be in all possible directions inside this neural space the convex hull tends to have the same functionality as the neural space. So the convex hull fails to capture the fact that these points are mostly lying on a hyperplane of low dimension. And of course, they will have fluctuations that hyperplane. But those fluctuations are small and can be neglected. They correspond to the non-leading eigenvalues in a principal component analysis. So I, I want to make a little bit of a, of a warning about the notion of convex hull, because it doesn't quite distinguish signal from noise. It wants to pay attention to the exact location of every point so that every point is included in the convex hull without having, without having projected into a low dimensional manifold. So this, as I said, this is observed in, a, you know, we wrote a little uh, review article in, a couple of years ago, talk, focusing mostly on, on primary motor cortex, but already at that time, and this was four years ago, actually, there was evidence of these low dimensional manifolds in all sorts of areas of the brain, not only in motor cortex, but in parietal cortex, in prefrontal cortex, in the sensory cortex, like vision and auditory cortices. Uh, and most recently, some work on Princeton has found this these low dimension and manifolds in hippocampus, which is extremely interesting. But for us as theorists, this is what comes next, which is very, very interesting, which goes back a little bit to, to, to your question before about why Gaussian or, and, and the underlying question, which is why linear. So as I said, we have this N1, N2, and N3, uh, in this case, empiric and neural spaces, the three neurons that were being recorded. But we find that the activity is mostly confined to a low dimensional manifold within this neural space. If the low dimensional manifold is flat, then it's a hyperplane. But it could be that the low dimensional manifold is not flat, and we have to really take into account that it is nonlinear. When it's linear, it's very easy to describe, right? Because essentially, we do a principal component analysis. And we get the two eigenvectors, u1 and u2. They are the columns of the u matrix. These are, in this case, each one of them is a three-dimensional vector. Each one of them is a neural mode that points in a given direction in neural space. So it has components along each one of the axes. But I only need to keep two of them. That's a dimensionality reduction. And there might be small fluctuations away from that hyperplane. But I'm going to neglect that those as due to noise. So now I have a basis. Every point in this hyperplane can be written as not only as a projection in N1, N2, N3, but as a linear combination of U1 and U2. Every point in this hyperplane has coordinates along this new axis provided by the new basis U1 and U2. So when it's hyperplanes, we are in business. We know exactly what to do, how to do it, and we don't have to do anything else. If it's curved, if it's a nonlinear manifold, 
then that gives work to lots of scientists because uh, many of us are interested in, in finding methods for describing the, the geometry. Locally, I can say I have a basis, I have two vectors, but now as I move along the manifold, these two vectors have to change. I don't have a universal basis as I do in the case of a hyperplane. So how am I going to describe this curvature? How am I going to describe this geometry? And how am I going to compute this dimensionality? So this is a topic of very, very active work, the question of finding these low dimensional manifolds and characterizing their geometry, their topology, and measuring their dimension. So this is the question of, of whether the manifolds are going to be linear and nonlinear. And again, the manifolds are latent models, because let's say that I had my trajectory in this space, but now I think of the trajectory, I project the every point, not on the axis N1, N2, N3, but on the axis U1 and U2. So the projection of the points along U1 gives me a trajectory along U1 that I call that the latent dynamics. This is trajectory seen from the U1 axis, and I can do the same from U2. So I have neural mode one gives me this latent dynamics, and neural mode two gives me the other latent dynamics. And the latent variables and the latent dynamics are a generative model, exactly as we discussed before, because we always think how to go from principal components to the latent variables, but I can also go to the, from the latent variables to the actual reconstruction of the data. And the way we do it is very simple again in the case of a linear model, because I just need to use the vectors, the matrix U, where the first column is U1 with the three components, and the second column is U2 with the three components. And these two by uh, these three by two matrix applied to the latent variable allows me to reconstruct the final rates. So the late, I can think of the latent variables as the building blocks of the neural activity from which the neural activity of the individual neurons can be reconstructed. So, and in the same way in artificial neural networks, the latent variables allow me to reconstruct the, the whole input on the whole output. So how would we go about the business of these nonlinear manifolds? So I want to give you at least one example of one such method. So again, I'm going to think of these of this, uh, neural recordings, you know, that come from the central task, again, measure of the order of 100 neurons over many reaches. And I can do my principal component analysis very simply. And I get an eigenvalue spectrum. This is, these are the eigenvalues in red for the principal component analysis. And you can see these eigenvalues decay very slowly. There is a leading eigenvalue, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four. I go all the way to lambda 10. And if I just look at these eigenvalues, there is no indication that I could have stopped after two or three dimensions. And yet I showed you a three dimensional representation of the data that was based on keeping only the three leading eigenvalues. So keeping lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, and the corresponding u1, u2, u3, and throwing away everything else. And it captured the essential of the data. It gave me these clusters. The clusters were organized according to target. But there is nothing here. There is no need, no singularity, nothing that change that tells me stop at three. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking to you about a method for nonlinear dimensionality reduction called isomap. And the eigenvalues of isomap are the blue eigenvalues. So I get lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, and then I get this plateau of eigenvalues. What does this tell me? It tells me that there is a leading dimension corresponding to the first neural node, a second leading dimension in which the variance is a little bit smaller corresponding to the second neural node. And then I get a lot of dimensions in which, yes, there is a fluctuation, there is a variance, but it's almost of the same magnitude. So this indicates noise. So I, I, a plane, which is not really a hyperplane, but a two-dimensional manifold, and then I can fluctuate out of that manifold. I have, if, if I'm living in a 100-dimensional space, I have 98 dimensions in which I can fluctuate out of that manifold. And in each one of those dimensions, 
The eigenvalues are very similar. Why? Because that's the amplitude of the noise. It's isotropic noise, and it's the amplitude of the noise in neutral and those directions. So if I had given you the blue spectrum instead of the red spectrum of eigenvalues, and I ask, how many dimensions do you think I should keep? What do you think is a good dimensionality reduction? Should I keep five? Should I keep 10? You would say, no, just keep two, three at most, and that's it. So using these nonlinear methods allow us to really understand the topology, the geometry of the nonlinear manifold and make decisions about how to do the dimensionality reduction that we cannot always do with the linear methods. So I want to, to spend the, the rest of my, my talk telling you a little bit about ISOMAP, which is a method that, that we have had for about 20 years. And, uh, um, and tell you how that works and how it allows them to get the blue spectrum instead of the red spectrum. So isomap is a, no, a method for nonlinear dimensionality reduction. And the way it works is like this. A linear method for dimensionality reduction puts a hyperplane in a neural space. And so this is the hyperplane. But isomap allows me to take an object like this. Was there a question? Uh, no, I don't think so. Ah. And, and, you know, allows you to take a, a very curved surface like this and map and kind of flatten it out so that I can get from isomap, from this very nonlinear object, I can also get a linear representation. So PCA allows me to do what is on the left, but isomap allows me to unravel a curved object like this on the right. So let's learn about isomap. Isomap is a very, based on a very powerful idea, which is the idea of a multidimensional scaling. And the idea of multidimensional scaling is that I give you a collection of objects, I give you a matrix of distances or dissimilarities between these objects, and I ask you to produce a space in which each one of these objects can be a point in this Euclidean space, so that the Euclidean distances between these points reproduces as well as possible this matrix of distances of dissimilarities. And the objects here, a priori, don't have to have any kind of Euclidean representation. Actually, there is a, a very nice old book on multidimensional scaling. And they mention a study that was done in Scotland that was a very interesting study where people went around pubs and drank all sorts of whiskeys. And then they were asked whether the whiskeys were similar or dissimilar. And then you do statistics over all the people and you say, well, of course, A is always identical to A. But in this case, you know, A and C are pretty similar. The distance is only two, the dissimilarity is only two. A and D are still pretty similar, but A and B are very different. And so that's a fun study to do. You know, we all go to Scotland and we spend uh, four weeks Instead of in the sous, you know, we go to all the bars, we sample the whiskeys, and we all keep our logs. And at the end, we aggregate the data and we come up with this dissimilarity matrix. We are com comparing whiskeys. There is no Euclidean representation of each brand of whiskey as an object, right? So, th this what we're trying to do is a totally abstract construction. We're trying to create an Euclidean space so that each object is represented as a point in that space, so that the Euclidean distances between these points are like this. A is close to C and close to D, but A is very far away from B, like reproducing this data as well as possible. So this is what the multidimensional scaling algorithm does. What multidimensional scaling does is solves this problem. So, Let's assume for a moment that the, the, we have data. The data is again, each data point is an n-dimensional vector. For instance, the n-dimensional vector of finding rates associated with each reach. So each data point is this vector x1, xn. We have m data points and we get this n by n matrix as before. Now assume that I have this matrix, but I hid it in my pocket. I don't give you this matrix. But I go and measure the distance between the pairwise distance between all these points. And what I give you is a matrix of distances between the points. Actually, I will give you a matrix of square distances. It's going to be an M by M matrix because I give you the matrix of the distance between the points, the, all the pairwise distances, 
but I don't tell you what, what the data was. Can you reconstruct the data from those matrix of distances? If I give you the matrix of distances, can you tell me what the data was? So let's start in the easy way and assume that the, my distances were actually Euclidean. So these elements of the matrix S are the distance square are simply the distance between xi and xj, data point i and data point j, squared. Okay. So note that from this distance, I could extract the scalar product between this distance squared is the norm of xi squared plus the norm of xj squared minus twice the scalar product between the xi and xj. So I can solve that for the scalar product and write xi dot xj or xi transpose xj as minus one half of the distance minus xi squared minus xj squared. Now, in matrix form, this xi xj, this x scalar product between xi and xj, is just x transpose x is the ij components of x transpose x. And then you can do a little bit of algebra and realize that what I had on the other side of the equation, which is the distance minus the norm square of the point X minus the norm square of the point, I'm sorry, the norm square of the point I minus the norm square of the point J can be also written in matrix form by thinking that I'm operating on the matrix S on the right and on the left by what is called a centering matrix J, where the centering matrix J is the identity minus one over M is that is full of ones, E, E transpose. So E is a column vector that has all ones and E transpose is a road vector that has all ones. So this is a rank one matrix that has all ones and I normalize it by one over M. So if you actually plug this and do this JSJ, you will see that you get SA, the IJ component of that matrix indeed gives you SIJ minus the norm of XI squared minus the norm of XJ squared. So then I can write this equation in matrix form. I can say X transpose X is minus one half of JSJ. But then I'm done. You are done because I gave you the matrix S. So you do this operation, you take S, you sandwich it between J and J, you multiply it on J by the left and on J by the right, you take minus one half of that, and that is X transpose X. But X transpose X is just a square of X in some sense. So once you have X transpose X, you can get X, which was your goal, right? I gave you the matrix of distances and I asked you, can you extract from the data from that? So, this is what we just did in, in matrix form. We said X transpose X, which is the covariance matrix essentially, is minus one half of J S J. And from that we can get to the data matrix X because X transpose X is the covariance matrix. Remember it was U lambda U transpose. So X is the square root of lambda times U transpose. So you can reconstruct X. And remember that, that lambda had the variances, the variances are the, the sigma squares. And so the square root of the variances, the square root of the eigenvalues are the standard deviations. So the matrix X is, is the, the rows of U because it's U transpose scaled by the appropriate standard deviations. So, if the distance matrix that I gave you had been obtained by an Euclidean process, and I gave you a matrix S, what so was a matrix of Euclidean distance, this process would, would be a, a perfect solution to the problem. And you would be able to recover the data matrix X from the matrix S of distances. But in principle, what I would there, you could do a dimensionality reduction. Don't keep all eigenvalues. Don't keep all M eigenvalues. Keep K eigenvalues. And that restricts the number of eigenvectors that you're using to reconstruct X. And then you get a low dimensional representation of X. Now you can prove that this truncation is equivalent to PCA. And it's just a one page of algebra. You can do that yourself. 
So in PCA, we would have used the covariance matrix, which is X, X transpose, which is N by N. This was X transpose X, was not exactly the covariance matrix. It was a covariance in, in the M space, it's M by M. And yet this process would allow you this truncation would equivalent would be equivalent to PCA. So these data points will be the same as the PCA projections. And again, you can we can easily do that. But the interesting thing, and this is the idea of multidimensional scaling, is that let's say I give you this matrix of square distances, which came from, from our, our trip to Scotland and our sampling of, of uh, different varieties of scotch. The matrix of uh, distances that you're given has nothing to do with Euclidean spaces, but you can still do what we did. You, I give you the matrix S, you define this matrix J, S, J, you take minus a half, and that gives you a matrix Y, and you think of Y as a matrix of, of scalar products. And so you take Y, you diagonalize it, you take Y as U, lambda, Y transpose, you will see that this Y is symmetric. This process can be done exactly as you would have done it for the covariance matrix. And then once you have done that, you say, well, X should be the square root of Y. So identify X with, if I think of Y as X transpose X, then X has to be the square root of lambda times U transpose. So this procedure now is not exact, but it solves an optimization problem. It solves an optimization problem of finding a matrix Y which is as close as possible, a matrix X, such that X transpose X is as close as possible to Y, as close as possible in the Frobenius sense. So there is a cost function over the matrix is X, says you are given S, you construct Y, and now I want to find an X such that X transpose X is as close as possible to Y in Frobenius norm. You know what the Frobenius norm is? So it's this element of the matrix minus this element squared, and then you sum over all the elements. So it's a way to measure the difference between these two matrices. It's, it's like in a non square of these matrices, think, if you think of them as vectors, essentially. So you can prove that if, if you minimize this cost function, if you find the X for which this provenance that is such that X transpose X is as close as possible to Y, is the best reconstruction of Y then you get this solution that X has to be lambda to the one half you transpose, where you transpose came from doing a principal value decomposition of the matrix Y. And the matrix Y came from this very simple operation, which we call the centering operation on the matrix S, which is the matrix that I gave you. So given S, you can always get X. Sarah, could you, could yeah. you could you repeat what is J in the non-Euclidean case? Uh, J is always the same. J, you, you take J to be the identity minus this, this uh, it's called a centering matrix. And in the Euclidean case, what J does is precisely subtracts the norms. But in the non-Euclidean case, it's just, it's just a, a transformation of the matrix of distances, which would have subtracted the norms in the Euclidean case but you can still show that this is going to be optimal in the Frobenius uh, sense, this particular operation. Okay, I see, I see now. Okay. So this is multidimensional scaling and the, the, the genius of Isomap came from a beautiful paper that Josh Tenenbaum and his collaborators wrote 20 years ago already. And his, uh, his I love this idea that he had, was how do I compute the matrix of distances? And his idea was to do an empirical version of a geodesic. So he said, okay, here is the data. I have M data points, and I would like to be able to compute a matrix, an M by M matrix of pairwise distances. So this is what I'm going to do, he said. For every point, I'm going to take a little <coughs> region around it, like an epsilon ball. And you can feel, you can fix the size of epsilon, or you can say 
an idea that I like better than that's the one we use, you can say, I'm going to make my, I'm going to make a ball until I have 10 neighbors. So if I am in a place with high density of points, my ball will be very small because very quickly I will gather 10 neighbors. But if I'm in a place with lower density of points, I will have to move further out before I capture 10 neighbors. And I like that idea better because then you're sampling with an epsilon ball, not of fixed radius, but of an, and a radius that is adaptive in some sense and takes into account the local density of points. So let's say we do that. We create little balls so that each point has 10 neighbors within that ball. So we say, well, locally, you know, no matter how curved the, the, the surface is, locally, I can think of it as flat. So I'm going to compute these distances from me to my 10 neighbors as Euclidean distances. So I begin to fill the space of distances. So now I know the length of the short steps. But how do I compute the distance from this point to this point? How do I compute? Because if I compute the Euclidean distance, I go on the dashed line. But if I go on the dashed line, I'm not, I don't capture the manifold. So how do I capture the manifold? And his idea was to do a geodesic in the following way. I will go from this point to this point, from, from A to point B, by walking on the manifold, meaning I will go from this point to one of its neighbors. I know the length of that step. And then from that point to another neighbor whose length I know. And I will construct a trajectory for which I know the length. And of all the possible ways to go from A to B, I will take the shorter, the shortest one. So this is a representation of what he means. Every, every you, you see the links that I was able to compute using my Euclidean distance. So I know those distances. Now, how do I go from this point to this point? Well, I walk taking short steps whose length I know because the short steps can be considered as flat and the length can be computed in the Euclidean manner. And of, of course, I could have gone from this point to this point by making a very long excursion going here, here, and then coming back. But so I do a minimax. So I take the shortest path, and it's a very nice sorting algorithm in computer science that allows me to find this approximation to a geodesic. So I call it a geodesic distance because I'm forcing myself to walk on the manifold. I only go from a point to one of his 10 nearest neighbors and then to one of his 10 nearest neighbors and then so on and so forth until I reach the point that I wanted to reach. And that is the metric of distances that is fed to the multidimensional scaling algorithm. So now what you get, for instance, if I did a 10, if I wanted to do a two-dimensional representation of this space, you'll get something like C here, where you can see that what you have done is you have taken the, you have flattened the nonlinear manifold and you have made it into an Euclidean space. And you can see that neighboring points in the manifold are neighboring points in this two-dimensional representation. A little regions in this manifold like this, like this uh, black, circle here become also re neighboring re na regions of neighboring points in the, in the flat representation. So that is the method of, mani of uh, manifold uh, learning. This method gives me again values because remember how I got X, I, it gave me this matrix of eigenvalues. So now I can go back to my plot and I can show you again the PCA eigenvalues versus the isomath eigenvalues. When I use the isomap data on my uh, reaching task, I very quickly saw that the two-dimensional representation was possible, that I didn't even need the three dimensions that I use in my factors analysis, that two was sufficient. And indeed, you can take all your data and you can project it into the two di in, the, in this two-dimensional flat representation that isomap gives you. And I see the same thing as I saw before. I see the clustering and I see that from target one, from the, you know, the orange target, I go to the red target, I go to the yellow target, so that I'm organizing the targets in the correct way as we did before. So is it, how, how non-flat was this busy surface? What can I say about the extent to which the surface that ISOMAP found differed from 
what I would have found using DCA. So what you can do is a comparison between geodesic distances and Euclidean distances. So I can go back to my data. Oops, what did I do? Here, I come back to my data. And for every pair of points, I can compute the Euclidean distance as if these points did not live in the manifold, as if there were just points in the space, and compute the geodesic distance, which will always be longer, right? Because I have to walk in the manifold. I cannot take the Euclidean shortcut. And then for each pair of points, I can plot the geodesic distance versus the Euclidean distance. As you can see, the short distances lie on the diagonal, because remember that the short distances in the geodesic, I approximated the manifold by being linear. So I computed the short distances by being Euclidean. So I expect to see some, some uh, here. And, and here you see that by the time the distances are 10, they are no longer connected by this single, single edges that are single edge in the graph that I use um, that I measure in an Euclidean manner, and I begin to deviate from that, and I get these longer distances. And that gives me a sense of the, you know, one can measure a nonlinearity index by looking at how this slope deviates from the 45 degree line and get the sense of the degree of curvature in the geodesic. So I want to, to finish by, by making some comments about linear versus nonlinear. So we talked about the fact that that if the data was confined to a hyperplane, then we could use a linear method to find the, a basis that define that hyperplane, mu1 and mu2 in this simple case, for a two-dimensional hyperplane embedded in a three-dimensional neural space. And if the manifold was not linear, then we have to do more work. And there's a very nice uh, paper by uh, Merhat uh, Yasa. Uh, yes, uh, Jerry at MIT and Sylvan Ostrogit at the Col Normal um, a, a year ago, where they discussed how to think about this intrinsic dimension of the nonlinear manifold versus our tendency to, to embed this nonlinear manifold in an Euclidean space. Like even in Isomap, you know, I kept on thinking this, this Swiss role, and I show you a two dimensional manifold embedded in a three dimensional space so that you can see, that you can visualize it. And, and uh, Berghard and Sturgeon made this notion very nicely by talking about the difference between the intrinsic dimension and the embedding dimension. So the intrinsic dimension is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. So for instance, if I have this little circle, the intrinsic dimension is, this is a one dimensional manifold. And if I now, you know, pinch it up and down this way, the intrinsic dimension is still one. However, if I ask what is the minimal dimension, the dimensionality of the smallest, smallest in the sense of dimension, Euclidean space in which I could embed this nonlinear manifold. In the case of that circle, two dimensions suffice. I can embed this ring in a two-dimensional space and I can see that it's, it's a one-dimensional manifold embedded in a two-dimensional space. But now if I start to pinch it up and down, like in the second drawing, now, for instance, in this case, I will need three dimensions to see this object. So the embedding dimension changes as a function of the degree of nonlinearity in the object. Because if I take this circle and I start pinching it, I create these regions of higher curvature. So I make the object more nonlinear. The second derivative becomes more and more important. But the intrinsic dimension doesn't change. For instance, if we, I live in a surface of a sphere, like we live in the surface of the air, my intrinsic dimensionality is two. You know, so the, this is where the flat earth ideas come from. So well, I look around myself and I'm walking in a two-dimensional space, right? However, the embedding dimension is three. That's the minimal Euclidean space in which I can see this crust, this surface of the sphere as a, a, as a manifold. So, when we do PCA, what we're looking is for an embedding dimension. So it's okay to do PCA with few, to start with a PCA, but don't make your PCA very small. You don't want to lose dimensions that you would have needed in order to reconstruct the nonlinear manifold. So 
you know, you have 100 dimensional data, okay, reduce it to 20, reduce it to 15, reduce it to 10, but don't reduce it to two using PCA. So do a, 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 a coarse dimensionality reduction using PCA to find an embedding dimension so that now you can work more easily. You don't have to work with the original hundred or thousand dimensions of your data, but be generous in the number of dimensions that you use for your PCA or for your linear embedding. And then in this lower dimensionality Euclidean space, you can begin to use more sophisticated methods to try to find a nonlinear manifold, but you have already gotten rid of a large number of dimensions. The question is not to gotten rid of so many, for instance, if the object was like this, and I pick two, I would have lost information that is crucial for me to reconstruct the object. So be generous in your choice of, of PCA, or your choice of linear dimensions, of linear embedding, and then use this lower dimension Euclidean space to try to find your nonlinear objects. So I, I show you PCA versus isomath, but I want to show you in, in, the, in the spirit of, of deep learning, a very general method of doing linear versus nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which is the notion of autoencoders. So autoencoders are networks where we put an input X, we map it through hidden layers, we create a bottleneck, a hidden layer of low dimension, and then we, our output Y, our desired output Y, is a reconstruction of the input. So we make an unsupervised learning problem, which is the dimensionality reduction of the data, into a supervised learning problem in some sense, because now every input has a desired output, which is itself. So we want the X hat, which is my estimation of the input, to be as close to X, which is the real input, as possible. This, this uh, bottleneck is the latent space. And the number of units that you put in the latent space is the dimensionality of the manifold. Now, I could make all these units linear. And if I make all these units linear, then it doesn't matter how many hidden I put, because you know a composition of linearities is still a linearity. So I wouldn't need any hidden layers. I could go from, let's see, what how many units did I put here? One, two, three, four. I would go from six to two to six directly with linear connections. It's a very old, uh, we know for many, many years now from the work of, of Baldi and Kornick in the late 80s, that if this network, the autoencoder network, if it's linear, it implements PCA. Now, it doesn't tell me that the top red unit is the leading principal component analysis and that the bottom red unit is the, the second principal component. It doesn't tell me that. But it gives me, sorry, it gives me two directions in space that, that span two linearly independent directions that span a subspace, which is the same subspace as, as would have been spanned by the two leading principal components. But it doesn't give me exactly the principal components with, with their associated variances as PCA does, okay? But it gives me the PCA subspace. And now I have a very nice way of getting going from linear to nonlinear, right? Because if I, if I started this network with, with a, a linear um, units, and I said, okay, so I'm doing two-dimensional PCA, or then I can begin to make these hidden units and these hidden units nonlinear and begin to create a nonlinear manifold. And what I expect to see if the object really was nonlinear. So let's say that this was 100 and I'm keeping 10 hidden variables, and this is a hundred again. So when my 10 hidden variables were a linear dimensionality reduction of the original data, I got some degree of reconstruction error. But now when I allow the units to be nonlinear, if the manifold is nonlinear, I expect to do better. Why do I expect to do better? Because of the eigenvalue distribution. You know, if I'm keeping, let's say the first four, the error that I'm making in PCA is all the subsequent has to do with the sum of all the subsequent eigenvalues. That's the error squared. But if I'm keeping four dimensions in isomap, yes, I'm, I'm neglecting the four eigenvalues, which are much smaller than the eigenvalues of PCA. And the difference between these two reconstruction errors 
is a measure of the nonlinearity of the object that you're looking for. So if I have done 100, 10, and 100, and now I see when the units get nonlinear, wow, I'm doing much better on the reconstruction. So try going from 10 to 9, and try going from 9 to 8, and see, try to find the true dimensionality of the embedded nonlinear manifold, of the nonlinear manifold that is embedded in this linear space that we started out with. Okay, so that's the that's a very powerful way of going from linear to non-linear without having to change algorithms in some sense, but by doing in slowly introducing a non-linearity and like you could introduce like a ReLU unit, but with a soft non-linearity and make it more and more like a threshold linear and see slowly how you what you gain. And what you gain is going to be more the more nonlinear your manifold was. So how much you gain is a measure of how nonlinear your manifold was. Now, why is this all interesting for real brains and for artificial neural networks? So I really love this, this recent paper that was accepted in iClear last year about the intrinsic dimensionality of images. So what they did is they analyzed a collection of images and, and the one that I was particularly interested in is in ImageNet. So ImageNet contains zillion trillion images and the images are 224 by 224 by three. So each image is a point in a, in a hundred thousand dimensional space, okay? So you say, oh, I'm killed, curse of dimensionality. What kind of classification method would allow me to make progress in a hundred thousand dimensional space? Well, these guys very systematically use different uh, uh, method uh, due to Levina, which is uh, called a maximum likelihood estimation. It doesn't find the manifold, but it estimates the, the dimensionality of the manifold. And it depends on a parameter K, which is, a little bit like the like the size of neighbors in in isomap is the, is is the is how many neighbors I am going to allow within my locally linear approximation essentially. So so they can do it for three five they did it for three five ten and twenty, and so they found that the dimensionality estimate depends on k. It seems to saturate. It doesn't depend so much between 10 and 20. But the dimensionality D, the intrinsic dimensionality of where these images live is between 26 and 43, depending on which method you use to estimate. 26, 43, let's say 50. Let's say 100 out of 100,000. So these images don't fill the space of all possible images. They live in a manifold that is very low dimension compared to the dimensionality of the space in which these images live. And we evolved our brains looking at images which are like that. So there's very, very interesting work that maybe Mar Mesar mentioned, but, but Lenka, your, one of your two fearless leaders, has uh, that beautiful work on, which is to study the statistical mechanics of, of neural networks when we don't assume that the inputs are Gaussian, you know, with, with the Gaussian whose covariance matrix has a rank which is equal to the dimensionality of the space, but assuming that the inputs actually have structure and they live in a low dimensional manifold, and how does that affect learning? Because we have spent years talking about the curse of dimensionality, but the curse of dimensionality is not so. If I do have to classify these images, I have to find a classifier that works in a 50 dimensional space not in a hundred thousand dimensional space, because the hundred dimensional thousand dimensional space is not being explored by the real world images that my brain evolved to process and that the deep ne learning network, the convolutional neural networks that I use to do classification in ImageNet are engineered to, to do a good classification job. In. They don't have to be good in a hundred thousand dimensional space. They have to be good in this 50 dimensional manifold. So the data tells us to look for these low dimensional manifolds, both in our engineered neural networks, in our biological neural networks, where the, the data, you know, guided the evolution of these neural networks over millions and millions of years. So this is why uh, dimensionality reduction is important, not only because then it makes your task easier, but because it captures something essential 
about the data that you're trying to model and the data that you're trying to understand. Again, be it in, in the context of an artificial neural network or be in the context of using your real brain to, to navigate the world and to make sense of the world around you. Okay, so I actually want to stop leaving you with these images of the non-linear manifolds, their intrinsic dimension and the and their um, embedding dimension, and maybe this image of how autoencoders are a very powerful tool for being able to go from a linear description to a non-linear description. And that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much. Right now, I don't think so. So, okay. so uh, as I said, this is my last lecture. But as I said, it, you, I know that you'll be working on projects here in the next two weeks. So, if any of your projects relates to any of the topics that I have discussed, I'll, I'll be happy to meet via Zoom one on one or with a small group of you, and we can discuss further whatever technical details or conceptual ideas you think you can use in your projects. Okay. Cool. And I, I, again, I'm sorry not to be there. It would be fun to, to have met you and, and interact more closely, but I hope you enjoy the rest of the school. I think Thank, you. Well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.